Groovy Leathers. I'm also on mute, my friend. I know. I know you can unmute yourself and do that. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome awesome. back to Movie Leftovers. Intro free, just a countdown. I love it. We're live on Twitch.tv. We're live on Twitter, I think. We're also live yes. on YouTube. Welcome, welcome, welcome in. Yes. Uh, yeah, dude. How are things? We're doing brick today. We are doing a brick and we're drowning slowly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a excellent lyric and a <laughs> nice little slide in there. there I go. appreciate it. It's there almost time topical too. This is what, 2004, 2005? 2005, yeah. And yeah. that song also came out. Well, I graduated in high school in 99 and that song was out during high school. So, yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. This, what, so what are your early thoughts on this film? Because this is one of those, like, this is one of those movies where I've watched enough times that mm -hmm. I decided I would go back and do some internet research on interviews of the stars of this movie around oh, okay. that time just okay. to get sort of some perspective. And I'm a humongous Joseph Gordon Lovett fan. Yeah, yeah, me too. He's great. And yeah, he, in a nutshell, and I won't go on too long, but he kind of was like, you know, one, one for the money, two for me, or two for the show kind of mentality when he went through this and mm -hmm. he really 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 wanted to break into into like doing an art house kind of sundance type of indie film yeah uh coming off this commercial success of doing you know third was third rock from the sun and a bunch of other mm -hmm. stuff that he was involved in and um what what lightning in a bottle was this film like i mean he and he seemed to really enjoy it it didn't have a very high budget uh this was kind of ryan johnson exploding on the scene as a director yeah, this and a writer was, at the same this time was this was his debut. Yeah. Um, I love this film. Wild. Yeah. This this movie is very much of its time. Mm -hmm. we, you know, I when we were when we were thinking about, you know, like reboots and remakes and spoiler, you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. You know, man, it, it's tough because this thing is so you're right. It is lightning in a bottle. It's yep. kind of like um, I would say it's almost like Boondock Saints in that way. Yeah, very and, much. You know, you really can't replicate this. Yeah. Um, that, that said, yeah, this movie for what it is, for when it is, it, it's phenomenal. The, the other it, thing yeah. I would say about this though, I think if you showed this to like a teenager now, mm -hmm. I don't think it would hit. No, I don't. Cause I think, I think you, you had to grow up in that era for this to make sense. Yeah. It would be a very, very niche film that I feel would have a light cult following later on if it was redone yeah. today, unless you change some major factors, which is going to be part of my take on this film as we go through the show. Um, I mean, th this movie came out at a weird time too. Like you also had, this was on the back of um, that Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah. When Boz like, Lerman's yeah. kind of like stylized you know, the old dialogue piece. I think there's a ton of inspiration there. Yeah. Yeah. There was a little bit of that in there. So yeah, man, this one, this one is great. Don't get me mm -hmm. wrong. It is great, but man, it is so much a time capsule. Oh, very much. Yeah. And for, I like the whodunits a lot and the kind of noir esque film, uh, style, uh, okay. even from like super old black and white films, you know, the, uh, Dick Tracy style characters, you know, I, I love that shit. And one of the things that I thought, uh, as far as this being a gem, I didn't know that Ryan Johnson hired family to do the score. It was like his cousin or something. Yeah. Yeah. But like the, it was such ahead. a family thing to, to put together. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the noir elements were all there, which I think is what he was going for, but I love the way they sort of poke fun at it too. Like if you think about it, there's a scene uh, with his mom in the kitchen, like looking for the right kind of juice to provide her son's friends. Uh, and then there's like a desk lamp in the back of the Chevy Astro van for no apparent reason. Right. Um, but what I didn't realize, and maybe this will come up in your uh, trivia, is that uh, I didn't know how much Cowboy Bebop was an inspiration for Ryan Johnson throughout this film, but it makes a ton of sense if you study it again. And I just finished watching it again this morning. But like Joseph Gordon-Lovett's character, like his hair looks like spike his walk with his hands in his pockets kind of hunched over the whole time with a slight hunch and then the camera focus always on the shoes and then they pan it up you know like i was like fuck that's where i've seen that before and i'm not a big anime guy but cowboy bebop is one of the more popular ones and 
I have seen a bunch of that. It's very stylistically similar. And I was like, ah, connecting more dots, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Even the way he smokes, like he smokes yeah. the way Spike smoked, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it it's very interesting. Even his attitude is very Spike-like, you know? Yep. Um. So yeah, it's, yeah, you definitely, once you know the Cowboy Bebop, you know, background is there, then yeah. you see it. Uh, I do have the the Rotten Tomato scores up there. Uh, oh, I I guess real quick, you should tell them what this movie's about. Yeah, for those that haven't seen it, <laughs> I yeah. skipped over. Uh, an entertaining homage to Noir's past that has been uh, slickly and compellingly updated to a contemporary high school setting. Yep. So, so yeah, I mean that's basically what it is. It is a a gumshoe detective mystery, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, looks like it was very popular. It's got an 80% on the certified fresh uh, yep. with the tomato meter and audience scores even higher than that at 86%. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a well-loved film. Absolutely. Um, the movie had a budget of four hundred or $450,000, which uh, according to the uh, Wikipedia was money that Rain, uh, Rain Johnson um raised from friends and family which mm -hmm. that's wild to have yep. to, to just go around to the people you know and be like hey i need money and then they come up with four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. yeah um, that's that's a ton for an indie film that you've never done before that you're trying to break onto the scene with but this made like what 10 times that amount uh so it ended up making uh 3.9 million so close to 10 times um so to give you an idea the 450 that he raised in today's equivalents would be just shy of $700,000 at 693. Mm -hmm. So, quite a bit of money. And then that that 3.9 million that it made would be close to 6 million today. So, yeah. Yeah. Would you if you were to put that in terms of like I have this money to buy a house with? Yeah. Like that's a it's a vastly different area of town you're living in for six and a half mil over the 600,000 that you bought. No, for sure. Still pretty good sure. eating, but yeah, holy cow. And, right. And what's wild is he was a film student, um, in LA at the time when he made this, you know, th this is one of those things that like, yes, he, he did it all on his own, but at the same time, man, he came from money to, to be able to do this. It's wild. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, his family owns a construction company and that's where they had a lot of the money. So, uh, it, it, it's nuts. He also, I guess, made a lot of connections in film school. That's, um, mm -hmm. he made, that's where he met Joseph Gordon Levitt to hire him, to bring him on. I'm sure Joseph, uh, took a pay cut to be in this film. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. He, in some of his interviews, he kind of goes on and states that it, it was like definitely something he wanted to be a part of, regardless of the circumstances. He just mm -hmm. needed to make something that was as a young actor, a lot more of an artistic expression. And he's like, I, you know, my head wasn't really in the right spot, you know, but I didn't yeah. want to do another commercial thing or sign a, another contract that would keep me like, we have control of you for nine months out of every year for the next X number of years to do a sitcom, you know? Right. Right. So. Uh, apparently these are based off of some, uh, man, I'm going to butcher this name. Dashiell Hammett novels, which is like a old school, detective film noir mm -hmm. type uh book series a paperback book series apparently uh rain johnson found out about those by watching an interview with the cohen brothers hmm. and they talked about that as inspiration and so he read all these books i guess there's only like three or four in the series just was obsessed with them what, what's wild too is now you look at you know we have the hindsight of future right because this yeah it's now 2023 and Ray Johnson also went on to do the Glass Onion films. Mm -hmm. uh, he's doing Poker Face, which is on Peacock. That's also a detective show. So very much he is the detective guy, right? Like that is his This thing. is a strength of his because I watched yeah. both of the Knives Out films. Mm -hmm. um, unbelievable cast and really, really fun, twisty storyline that just keeps you engaged through more of a pop comedy type of thing rather than this like darker edgy or noir thing that they tried in brick oh. early on but it's way better <laughs> than yeah. some of his massive movie like the star wars thing and all that stuff it's like if you could just erase that from ryan johnson's portfolio and keep him in this pocket 
this is the pocket I want to see Ryan Johnson in because I think when filmmakers, and obviously it's gotten much larger with Knives Out, but when filmmakers have no budget to rely on, this is a note I made, mm -hmm. uh, they often have to rely on dialogue and a strong vision for their project. Some filmmakers keep that skill forever, some do not. And yeah. I think Ryan Johnson is one of those that kind of, you know, when big studios are involved, things kind of take a turn. So that's Robert my Rodriguez opinion. talks about that. Like sometimes it's you're more creative if you have less money. Yeah, you got to keep focused. Deadlines mean it doesn't happen if you don't get it done, you know. But he shot a lot of this film himself, like in the back of the car with, uh -huh. with the Laura Dannon character. He edited the entire thing uh, and he edited it, in, edited it in such a way that it kept the the movie very snappy and quick. Right. And, I, you know, you got to do it. You got to get on those deadlines and stay on them. So, yeah, I think Robert Rodriguez is right. That was my observation as well. It was just like, feels like, uh, there is no plan B type of motto is the best way to go for some of these directors. And some keep that skill. Some not yeah. so much. <laughs> right. A uh, fun fact, the guy who plays Dode in brick mm -hmm. has also been in both of the knives out films. As oh, interesting. Characters. I guess yeah. I didn't pick that up. Yeah. Yeah. So he's in, in the second one, glass onion, he's that random guy that shows up all the time. Mm -hmm. That's, that's that makes Dode. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, man, um, you know, this film, people love it. It's got a cult following, but it's people like our age that love it. Right. Yeah, like, totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I don't hear a lot of the younger kids that, you know, are loving it. It's not one that's brought up in film schools. Um, yeah. Right but I, I think it should be. I think this is a fun snapshot movie. Uh, yeah, it does take, you know, a, upon first watch, I remember the dialogue was tough enough to try and follow the story. I couldn't quite put it together a hundred percent until the very end, you know, scene, which I won't reveal anything, but it's worth the watch now watching it over again. And I've seen this a bunch of times. Uh, you just kind of have to get used to the way they talk and everything is very readable. Like, yeah, so you see, it's not a complex movie. It's not a complex no, no, storyline at all. So, you know, I, for I what it's worth, it was just done well. Thinking, yeah. When I was younger, I thought it was more complex. But now mm -hmm. as an adult, I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. I see what this is. Yeah. 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 A lot of a lot of drawn drawn out dialogue and very few camera tricks uh, in favor of pushing the story further with no budget than would be all the over the top shit you see in Glass Onion, the effects, the, you know, the the landscapes they shoot in and the sets they have become characters in that movie in a lot of ways. And so for yeah. those movies. So yeah. I I feel like this film though, it really dances to the edge of like where it was so serious it could have been a comedy. Like it was close to that. It never got over that edge. Yeah, that's like that's why I like that they kind of took shots at themselves a little bit. Yeah, like the the mom and the juice and all yeah. that shit. Yeah, you're well, right though. But, I mean, honestly, like musical choices and some of the scenes. Like if you had put ska music instead of like their serious music. Yeah. <laughs> instant comedy. <laughs> exactly. Right? Yeah. With the exact same shots, the exact same everything else going on. Instant comedy. Yeah. So like it's right on that edge. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we'll tell you what, let's let's take a break and then we'll come back and we'll talk about our reboot or sequel pitches and uh, we'll be right back. Groovy. Sounds good. All right, we're back. We are back. Welcome back. It's Movie yes. Leftovers. We're doing Brick from 2005. Indeed. Indeed. So uh, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, okay. I don't, I don't have a lot to change on this other than the cast. So I'm in essence to the point you made at the top of the podcast, you know, I don't think this would resonate with a modern audience the way that it was kind of a snapshot in time. I would update it to modern time, mm -hmm. but I want, I want a full reshoot with an appropriate mm -hmm. budget. Uh, the only modifiers i think i would have to the original story and dialogue would be that we need a few more characters to die to kind of push pace and then slow things down in the dialogue long shots that they have okay so i'd probably find a way to kill off brain i'd okay. kill off dode and kara and i would bring in the police and the school staff um and i want them 
to have like the both the authorities and the Brendan character mm -hmm. to be after the same thing, but the police are trying to pin it on Brendan and they keep getting closer and closer to him. And really what I want that for is so I can have them pull him in for questioning <clears throat> so I can have my the town interrogation scene between John Hamm and Ben Affleck type of thing. Oh, nice. You yeah, know what yeah, I mean? And like yeah, yeah. have that written in there. So, but complete reshoot, I would modernize things, get rid of the old flip phones uh, and pay phones and stuff right. that you're not going to find anymore for burner phones and things. But here's, here's my cast. And I don't like doing young actors because I don't know all of the young actors. So I really, really have to like research for hours to figure out what they've been in. And if I think it stylistically works. So uh, we'll just go kind of out of order. Uh, vi the vice principal guy, I want to put Don Cheadle in there. Okay. Okay. That's a good call. One of the bulls. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now I think he might be a touch old for this, but the magic of makeup, I don't know, but tug the bully yeah. guy. I want Wanna Taylor Lautner in there. Yeah. Yeah. I think Taylor Lautner would be good. Okay. Um, so the, for, for Kara's character, uh, I would cast Joey King. She was the girl from bullet train. I don't know if you saw that recently. Yeah, I did. I like the, the main villain. Yeah. So yeah. I would have her in as Kara. Okay. Um, for Dode, I would put Jaden Smith in there. Oh, okay. So I think that would be sick. Uh, Laura Dannon's character, and and I love the original actress that played her a lot, but uh, I picked Camilla Mendez. She plays Veronica on Riverdale. Oh, okay. Okay. So I would have her as the Laura character kingpin i would cast timothy chalamet of course uh for emily i would put millie bobby brown in there oh all right and then for brain i would have tom holland and then going back to riverdale for brendan i would cast cole sprouse because i think he would be perfect for that role yeah i could see that so we're gonna make jughead brendan but so okay. that's that's actually two riverdale characters but i like both those actors Okay. So that's about it. I, I really like the dialogue. And uh, to cap it all off, I would have Ryan Johnson reshoot it and try and modernize the stuff just to keep the the original creative line where it's at. I would just want to be more in control of the casting and kind of see how things go. But I think the storyline's awesome. I think modernizing it into the place they put it in, similar to the Boz Lerman's Romeo and Juliet, is great. Uh -huh. I really like when people do this. Um, I have seen it movie or two where it didn't really connect but they were really trying for it but more often than not i think this is cool plus i like the over stylized whether it's through dialogue or through period pieces i kind of enjoy that because it just takes you it arrests disbelief and takes you into an imaginary place you know you're there you know yeah yeah uh so yeah that's that would be my thing i, I would like to keep the storyline like i said as close to the original as i could so that would be my cast and a reshoot but i would mostly keep things the same uh, because I think this is just a perfect, I think this is just a perfect puzzle piece film that just sits in, in the landscape very well. So, okay. Okay. Uh, I would set mine also, I would do a sequel. I would set it in modern times. Mm -hmm. Right. And I would, I would do a different main character. Okay. Um, so very similar, being the same storyline, just years after days after that. Kind no, of thing? no, no. Completely new cast, completely oh, okay. new scenario um but this would be the son of brendan so got it the son of jo joseph gordon lovett's character um but this kid would be played by jack dylan grazer who mm -hmm. was the kid from uh shazam he's the kid with the crutch who's kind of a smart ass yeah uh, i think he's perfect for that role nice and, and what i would do is he's going to be an american student who goes to europe for foreign exchange okay okay and he finds himself in some hot water over there, but he's a fish out of water, right? He doesn't know all the players. Yeah. <laughs> that's his element, right? And what I would do is I would kind of base this off the whole Amanda Knox situation where someone gets Oh, okay. And, and they've got to solve the mystery. And yeah. And maybe he's being blamed for it, you know? Sure. So he's trying to, to prove his innocence. So I would use that as my template for him to to build the mystery around um, <laughs> little man to Knox, little gone, baby gone. Yeah. A little bit of that. Stuff. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I would not explicitly say that he is the son of Joseph Gordon Levitt until the very end 
when he calls his dad and says finally that he's coming home because he's cleared himself. And then that's when you do the cameo of Justin Gordon-Levitt on the phone. Oh, I like that. So who are we just going to leave who the mom is to the imagination? Is it like Laura Dannon? Yeah, we're not going to say. Away? It's just, we're just not going to say. Yeah, it doesn't really matter at this point. It's just okay. he, the kid's got to get himself back to America. Yeah. Got to get back home. You know, they've taken his passport. They've, you know, they're they're about to arrest him. The whole deal. So, so then I would I would write a sequel to your sequel and make a trilogy, but it would be basically taken, except uh -huh. for with Joseph Gordon Lovett. Yeah, there you go. And he there has to go. learn a special set of skills. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, he did learn them from Batman in that one yeah. movie. So right? there you, yeah. So he's good. He's good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's what I would do. I think I think Jack Dylan Grazer is perfect for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, your your femme fatale that you always have in these kind of films probably do zendaya sure she seems like perfect for this too you know um yeah i don't know i mean i, I really didn't think about i'm not good at, at coming up with mysteries mysteries is not my strong suit for for mm -hmm. writing um there's so much you have to think about with the mystery but at least that's the fundamentals of what i would do at least yeah i i do enjoy mysteries and trying to think up scenarios i wouldn't call myself talented at any kind of writing but uh, I definitely enjoy this as a as a challenge to write in. You know, I would the definitely thing with take a shot at you it. You have to start with the end and then yeah, work yeah. your way back and, and mm -hmm. put it all into play. Yeah, I mean, um, I wrote a, a story in alliteration based off the punchline to a dad joke, and it actually turned out pretty good. <laughs> there you go. Good. There you go. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not a screenwriter though, so yeah. I I would have like um, instead of just him being the one detective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I would also do like a a rival to him that's like a, a wannabe cop guy, mm -hmm. you know that that's investigating the crime straight and and thinking that he's already guilty, and so I would have a rival to him. Sure. So that character, I don't, God, I don't even know who would play that. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe somebody, I don't, someone that could play a real jerk. I don't, I don't, I don't know the young actors. Yeah, I, I could see, I don't know. Like, the more I think about it, the more I start thinking about, like, some sort of bizarre take on Sherlock Holmes, you know? <laughs> it's like two young detectives that hate one another rising to the top. Oh, <laughs> uh, you, you know you know who would be good now that I think about it? Um, there was, they, so there's that show Superman and Lois where he's mm -hmm. got the two sons. Um, the They had one of the kids recently leave the show. The one that left, I forget his name. Okay. He would be good because he, he kind of looks like a smarmy asshole. So, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit. So uh, I the, think he would be good. The one actress I've always had a crush on my whole life is in that series as well, uh, Emmanuel Shrieky. She was oh, known yeah. for like horror movies. And then I think she played a uh, main character's girlfriend in um, Entourage or something for years. But... I think she plays, uh, gosh, I don't remember. Is it she Lana plays somebody? Lang? Yeah, maybe. I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's like, uh, she's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing about that show is they have coded Lana Lang to be Latino or Latina. Mm -hmm. And so it's really forced because like yeah. nothing about it is her being Latina until like every now and then they drop a mija or it's your quinceanera yeah just, like, just so slapped on there right it's just taped over the top yeah yeah, yeah. and not so innocuous yeah 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 it just uh they're trying they're trying yeah. but they're not <laughs> they, they need to do little subtle things like if she's got a coffee a little panduzzo on the side you know sure something. right yeah make it softer don't just Oh crank, yeah, we forgot. <laughs> crank up the authenticity. Don't make yeah. it an afterthought. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> I like I like uh, the idea that you're you're taking it in, and I think it would be fun to make that almost like a like a franchise of movies. You know, see yeah. what happens after that. But yeah, for the, for those of you that that haven't seen this before, definitely give it a spin. I think this this movie is really cool. It's not. A difficult watch. Uh, it is a lot of fun, yeah, and it's kind of neat to see how they should. You know, knowing how they shot this, we were talking off off uh, camera a little bit before the show, and they started and finished this thing in twenty days. 
Mm -hmm. and they were using sets like a high school in like the town that Ryan Johnson <laughs> lived in in Southern right. California on the weekends. Yeah. You know, the, the pins house, they had a very limited time to pull permit and shoot in there. Uh, and I think part of it was probably guerrilla shooting because that house yes. was to be torn down. Right. So like, it, it's very, very cool. You know, the way the sets kind of worked out and the lighting kind of seemed to stick, but in a 20 day span of time, that's an incredible achievement for what this uh -huh. film became. And, Give it a spin. I, I give it I give it a thumbs up for sure. Awesome. Yeah, I would recommend it as well. So it's a lot of fun. Um, but yeah. Uh so for our next movie. Um, yes, sir. Is it, it's my turn my, to pick, right? It is. Let me grab oh. my uh, notepad here. So well, I, I will have down. to send you the link because I cannot find it anywhere else. Man, other than you find YouTube. these movies I can't get a hold of. <laughs> well, this is on YouTube and it's okay. free on YouTube. Uh this is gonna be as obscure as fall AF right all right um so for those who are listening man this is going to be a hard one to find it is on youtube uh we're gonna watch newsboys under the big top this is a film that the 90s christian <laughs> music group the newsboys made wow yeah yeah and this is a it's a doc no they made a movie it's a movie it's a movie. It is an actual movie. Uh, okay. I used to have the VHS of this film. I cannot wait to see your reaction to watching this thing. Wow. Yeah, this is going to be this is going to be one of those pulls you back in time things for sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. I was like trying to figure out an associated act like Amy Grant and Michael W. Smith. And yeah, yeah. Uh, who who else was in that era, man? P.O.D. Oh God, DC Talk and DC Talk, yeah. Audio Adrenaline, still a good band. Yeah, early I mean, jars even of clay. even upon re-listen, oh, Jars of Clay, jeez, dude. Yeah, wow, I still you like got jars these on the ready. Yeah, I haven't listened to any of these. They were kind of like the Copeland of Christian contemporary Christian rock music, right? Copeland is Christian rock music. Well, they were on a Christian rock label. Were they a Christian rock act? I don't know. Yeah, they, they were. Were they? Were they? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so who would be their equivalent? The plain white tees? God, who's the one who sings cars? Snow Patrol? Oh, Snow Patrol. Yeah, that's a pretty good association. Yeah. Yeah, wow. There was a... Uh, well, that brings us back, huh? Yeah, right? Long totally time ago. dating us right here. Dude, so... Okay. <laughs> so, Newsboys made a movie. Interesting. Yeah. I, uh, I can't wait to can't wait to check this it, out. What's so. wild is if you look up the makeup of Newsboys now, it's completely different than this film. Wait, are they still a touring act? They are still a touring act. Wow. Uh, they've got Michael Tate from DC Talk as now their lead singer. Okay, so like it's complete. It's a mashup of like early nineties yeah. or it's late nineties, early two thousands Christian bands that are now one super group. It's kind of wild. <laughs> Perfect. <clears throat> Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yes. But. All right. Well, yeah. So Newsboys Under the Big Top. I will check that out on YouTube. Uh, you yeah, can check us it, out on this Twitch. thing is such a train wreck. I can't wait for people to watch it. <laughs> and wherever else you get your podcast. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Cool. Thanks, everybody. We'll catch you next time. <laughs> Bye.